Namaste. Salam alaikum. Good evening from Secretary Office of Global South Coalition for Dignified Mensuration based in Nepal. I'm Radha Powdell, nurse, author, activist, and founder for Global South Coalition for Dignified Mensuration. It is a global network for changing the narratives around mensuration from five days bleeding to life cycle approach. Therefore, dignified menopause is an important theme for us. To discuss about dignified menopause or menopause without any discrimination at home, at workplace or community or everywhere, we have a speaker all the way from UK. He is Dr. Bikram Talaulika. Sorry if I uh, pronounce uh, wrong. Namaste. Well, thank you. And let me introduce him. Dr. Bikram is a specialist in reproductive medicine at University College London Hospital, NHS Foundation Trust, and Honorable Associate Professor in Women's Health at the University College London. His clinical interest includes reproductive endocrinology, polycystic ovary syndrome, recurrent miscarries, premature ovarian insufficiency, and menopause. He's a certified menopause specialist by British Menopause Society. He has published widely in reproductive medicine and menopause. He is a member of the British Family Society, European Society of Human Reproduction and Entomology, Embryology, British Menopause Society and International Menopause Society. He has so many um, uh, 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 hats. He runs a busy menopause and PCOS clinic at UCLH and menopause clinic London on Harley Street. He's a principal trainer for FHRH menopause assess module and trainer for BMS principal and practice of menopause care program. If I do any mistake, or if I did not tell you rightly, please feel free to uh, justify Dr. Bikram. Uh, let's thank welcome you. to Dr. Bikram. Uh, thank you for thank you for calling me for this program, Radha, and thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you. And it's a great honor. Thank you very much for managing the time. I know you are super busy. Um, and as a man. Uh, would you tell us about your interest or how did you inspire to work? Uh, you have so many areas like in Guinea and Ops and why did you choose the menopause? What is your inspiration? Would you share that, uh, uh, your experience, please? Yes. yes, I think it's both. Um, I think as much as you are passionate about working in menstruation, Radha, uh, my passion for menopause got triggered along the line when I worked as a gynecologist. For two reasons. One is often when you work as a gynecologist, you do a lot for women about their pregnancies, deliveries, post-pregnancy care, heavy bleeding, uh, uterine or other problems. But I thought that there was very little attention on menopause. Uh, people talk very little once the pregnancy and the family is complete. You don't often get the same attention being talked about when the woman stops her periods. What happens after that? What happens in 60s, 70s, 80s, more than one third of the life of a woman is in menopause. But people did not talk a lot. So these women often asked for help in clinics when they suffered some symptoms, but there wasn't a concrete answer. And that's where my interest for menopause got triggered. But partly also my own family, I've seen my mother go through menopause and she did have symptoms during menopause. And I sometimes think back at the time that she went through menopause, I wasn't so much aware there's not much talk about menopause in families um, across cultures. And so I thought that if I can do any contribution to make this topic uh, more talked about in households, in families, in communities, it will make difference to a small number of people who may be wanting help. 
यू एम म्यूट राधा थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर वेरी पावरफुल स्टोरी आई ऑल्सो हैव अ पर्सनल स्टोरी रिगार्डिंग द मेनोपोज माई टू सिस्टर्स हैव सर्जिकल मेनोपोज एंड दे स्ट्रगल अलट and i have other friends as a is a nurse so people keep asking about it and today uh, uh, so many nepali friends will be watching this conversation our uh, dignified menstruation uk chapter uh, coordinator sudha gurung she has already shared the um, uh, link uh, in different platforms i see the notification as you shared earlier uh, people are not giving the attention do you have any idea why do people have little attention on menopause what is what could be the reason because we we have done so much progress uh, in um, overall medical uh, gyne herbs and why is uh, not for uh, around uh, menopause there are there are many reasons for why menopause is often left behind um and of course the main attention has to focus on life threatening things for example childbirth pregnancy miscarriage ectopic pregnancy uh, heavy menstrual bleeding and uh, the need for treatment for that often has taken a priority and that's right because those things can kill people menopause often has not been a priority because it's mainly about unpleasant symptoms about quality of life um, and that's why it has been second on the list also partly because it's a chronic uh, sort of uh, issue it's not something acute not emergency and often uh, you have to look after the holistic picture it's not like you come with a tumor and you remove the tumor or you have a problem with bleeding you do a medical management this is encompassing the whole life uh, it encompasses quality of life bone health heart health brain health and so often it's a long term sort of clinical situation uh, or physiological situation rather than a short medical treatment which is why it has always been on the back of the line culture sometimes say that if you've got menopause it's just part of physiology you have to accept it but sometimes that fails women because some women may have a difficult menopause they have surgical menopause or they have lots of symptoms more than other women who don't have symptoms and the, and culturally often it is if you've got menopause it will come for every woman just get on with it you have to suffer the symptoms and get on that's not correct so it's both cultural perception and the not acute nature of the menopause that is why it often has been left behind over the years yes agree mm. for menstruation even there is a silence there is a taboo but some extent the parents even fathers inquired through the mother because they they are worried about the marriage and they are worried about their their future whether they have the babies or not and if there is a child marriage already and the babies and no one think about the menopause this is how i see it. and um, how do you define menopause itself uh, because many of my colleagues or audience do not know about the menopause just uh, first week of uh, uh, july we went to sri lanka for uh, training of trainers on dignified menstruation and menopause was the uh, one uh, most liked uh, title uh, during the conversation and many of our friends do not know about it so would you elaborate a little bit about it yes and um, so most of the research into menopause has happened in the western world in the sort of white european population so what i'm going to talk about may be a lot of european research uh, and it's slightly different from women coming from say nepal southeast asia or afro caribbean region but i'm going to give you a overall view of how things go during menopause so most women have menopause between the age of 45 to 55 and this is when their periods will stop so they are having periods every month every two months throughout their life and when they come to around 45 46 the periods will start changing a little bit and for the first 3 to 5 years it is often irregular periods with some symptoms that is we call as the perimenopause that means you haven't gone through menopause you're still producing some hormones from your ovary 
and you're having irregular periods, uh, some symptoms like feeling very hot, hot flushes, sweating, night sweats, sleep becomes a problem. You may feel your mood becomes very low. Uh, you feel your achy uh, sort of bones and joint pains become quite prominent. Sometimes you have memory loss, brain fogging, can't remember what you're saying. And those sort of symptoms will start at this point. And after four or five years, you finally have no period. So you have your final period, period stop, and the symptoms may last for another five or 10 years. That's called as the menopause. So once your periods have completely stopped for a year, that is menopause. So you've gone from perimenopause to menopause. And then from that one year onwards until the end of your life, it is all postmenopausal phase. Some women will have lots of symptoms which are difficult, but others may not have many symptoms and they will be lucky because they don't have as many troublesome or severe symptoms. And that sort of wide variation is there, is that some women are lucky to have an easy menopause, others may find it difficult. In Southeast Asian population, you find that the menopause happens earlier. So the average age in India, for example, is 46 and a half while the average age in the West is 51. So five years earlier, which is quite significant. And as you rightly said, some women can have menopause below 45, which is early menopause, or they can have surgical menopause because of hysterectomy, removal of ovaries, or they can have premature menopause below the age of 40, which is very young. And there can be lots of difficulties due to lack of hormones. So that's a sort of spectrum of when menopause can happen, what are the symptoms that you expect, and how eventually your periods stop. Thank you. Thank you. I'm still wondering why there is a difference between uh, the European um, age for menopause and the Asia or Asia Pacific region. What is the reason? Is it the malnutrition or... What would be the reason? Because five years is, is, is really quite a big, big gap. It's thought to be both. It's the genes and the environment. So genetically, one of the reasons why menopause happens is that genetically women are born with a set number of eggs. They, are, they have millions of eggs at birth. And after puberty, they will keep using those eggs so that very few eggs are left by the time they get to 50 only thousands of eggs are left and then menopause happens once the eggs are finished. Maybe that genetically women are born with a smaller number of eggs in certain communities or cultures. And so they use them up earlier by 40 or 45. Also, it could be that they use up the eggs faster because of genetic reasons. Or it could be, as you said, a lot of cultural influences like malnutrition, infections, uh, pollution in the environment, toxins in the environment, all those factors, including socioeconomic class, all of them have some sort of an influence uh, on how the individual will attain menopause. If you have lots of other medical disorders, immune disorders, arthritis, uh, then again, you will likely to have uh, menopause early. And so other medical conditions also have a toll. Thank you, thank you. It's more clear now. Uh, earlier, you talk about the pre uh, perimenopause uh, or early menopause. I received the messages, phone calls from the friends who are only 35, 36, 37 years, and they have a menstruation, but they have a few symptoms like a uh, heart flush and some sort of brain fog. Uh, is that the um, per perimenopause or should they consider other things? Do you like to comment on this regard, please? Yes, it's a very good question. So perimenopause will usually happen once your periods start changing, you have the symptoms that you described. If it happens very early when they are 35, it could be a sign that it could be early perimenopause for them, and they may be heading towards what we call as premature menopause below 40. But equally, some women continue to have periods throughout their life and get some of the symptoms like brain fogging, hot flushes, or sweats during their cycle, especially as they come towards the period, their estrogen levels can drop. 
And just before period or soon after the period, during that phase, they can get lots of menopause-like symptoms. That is because their body is very sensitive to the drop in estrogen that happens during a normal menstrual cycle. That is slightly different from perimenopause. So the advice would be, if you have this every month, you notice some of the symptoms that lack of estrogen causes for you, you can consider some treatments to try and take during that period of time when you have the symptoms every month, but this is not perimenopause. But if you have these symptoms and your periods start showing big gaps, then that's perimenopause. You may be heading towards premature menopause. Then you might want to again discuss your management options accordingly. So there are two slightly different entities, but similar symptoms. It's really useful. And you talk about brain fog. Usually people really confuse with the brain fog. Um, what kind of symptoms uh, the women uh, come off with the brain fog? Um, can you, can you uh, share based on your experience, please? So many women will come and say, I don't remember the name of the person I just spoke to. Uh, they just spoke to me a while ago, but I can't recollect their name. You come to a room and then you find out, oh, why did I come to this room? What was in my mind? I forgot about it. They are, say, they are delivering a lecture. They are standing in a meeting. They are delivering some talk and they suddenly become blank. They can't remember the word. They can't recollect what they were going to say. They can't talk about the next slide. That happens quite common. And then that sets fear or panic. Oh, I, I should avoid big meetings or social situation because I'm now starting to forget these words. These are very common examples of how your brain fogging can happen during the uh, perimenopause menopausal transition. How could we overcome with that kind of things? Is there any any ways like a behavioral therapy or something like that? How could we minimize that kind of uh, brain fog? So with the brain fog, yes, of course, there are many therapies because the symptoms are not in isolation. They're usually connected. So brain fog causes anxiety. Anxiety has back uh, impact on more brain fog. If you're not sleeping well, you're having hot flushes, sweat, then you don't sleep well, you feel tired. And again, you feel more brain fogging memory. So often in that sort of many symptoms together, uh, one option, of course, is hormone replacement for women who would like to consider it and it's safe for them. For others, there are many other techniques, mindfulness, relaxation, CBT, some uh, isoflavones or herbal therapies, they may be useful. Not all of them are evidence-backed in medicine, but of course, some women may want to avoid HRT, then these sort of therapies can help. So it's a combination approach rather than one particular treatment. Got it, thank you, thank you. And often people mixed with the dementia, brain fog and Alzheimer's kind of thing in general talking, uh, how, could they differentiate whether it is because of the perimenopause or menopause or it's a really dementia or Alzheimer's? Is there any, any tips for them? Yes. So dementia is a disease of quite late age. It won't happen so early. Dementia usually sets in in their 70s and 80s. That's because there are so many different processes, aging, uh, blood supply to the brain becoming less, and of course, the changes with hormones throughout your life. All that will usually affect you in your 70s, 80s. That is dementia. The, the forgetfulness that you get due to hormones, due to changes to the estrogen level, often happen in your 40s, 50s. Uh, and those will be really uh, uh, along with other symptoms. So your periods or hot flushes or night sweats or your mood changes. You'll be able to see that there are so many things happening, not just the memory issue, which happens with dementia. Similarly, you find that uh, with the brain fogging that happens during menopause, often it happens for a few years. And if you take treatment, it will disappear or it may go on its own. After the five years, six years, many women report their brain fogging has gone completely on its own because they get used to the lack of hormones. But dementia is late onset. It won't reverse itself. It will happen late in life. And those symptoms will be quite in isolation on their own. So usually as a medical professional, you'll be able to differentiate between the two. What is important to remember is if you have brain fogging because of hormones now, that doesn't necessarily mean you will have dementia. There's no medical evidence for that. It just means your symptoms now is because body is struggling to lack of hormones. 
It doesn't mean you will always have dementia later on. We need much more research about that. We are not sure about that right now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, when we see the posters um, at very first, we started to receive the different kinds of questions and inquiries because no one talked about the menopause and there are not uh, available of the reading materials as well. And most of the times, uh, it's like a medical perspective kind of talk. They don't talk in a general setting. So um, this is the real uh, one of the common concern I receive. That is why I like to share here. And Dr. Bikram, I'm sure you have been uh, consulting or counseling or treating hundreds, thousands of uh, uh, um, uh, um, menopausal, perimenopausal women in your life. Um, do you experience any kind of like a Thiago stigma or discrimination associated with the uh, menopause? A lot. There's a lot of taboo stigma still out there. Even in the Western world, less so here. Uh, but across the cultures, there is still a lot of taboo stigma. Women still feel embarrassed, uh, still feel that the conversation about menopause, whether it be with their partner, their family, their community, their friends or doctors, it is a difficult conversation for many people because these issues are very personal, very sensitive. And different cultures view menopause differently. Uh, some cultures now are quite open about talking about menopause trying to give a positive message. If you need help, there is help. You don't need help. You can make the most of this phase of life. Other cultures are not so open. Still talking about menopause is thought to be a troublemaker. You don't know how to get on with life. It's thought to be depression, low mood, and often the feelings or the symptoms are uh, discounted and uh, that this is not true. You're just feeling this in your mind. So that sort of thing still happens. And that's why women feel the stigma associated. That is why these programs are important. The message for us to give out is you're not alone. Yes, not everyone has a horrible or difficult menopause, but for some women, menopause can be difficult. There's lots of help or support available. And you can talk about it to everyone as parents, family members, colleagues, friends, community members. We should be able to allow women to talk to us openly in a dignified manner about menopause so they can get the help they need. That is essential. Thank you very much. You took the taboo stigma discrimination even with the partner or husband. Would you a little bit elaborate about the role of the partner or husband to take care of the perimenopausal or menopausal wife or partner please yes that because a lot. let me sorry let me elaborate this question again because most of the times men are not considered the menstruation is is, is a um, everyone business or men business yes. the menstruation no matter whether it's a menstruation bleeding or the menopause is, is a very private very much a men's concern and uh, even in the uk i i read a one book called surgical menopause that book I translated in Nepali. And then I knew that the nine to 12 years took to diagnose and, and really get through the uh, uh, menopause. So the role of the partner, role of the husband is very much crucial. So I really wanted to um, hear more details about it. Thank you. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, so for, for most women, their partner will be the first person they can talk to about, say, menopause or menstruation. So if they're not supportive, it's very difficult for the woman to talk to somebody else about it. But if you are a supportive partner, a supportive individual who wants to help the woman, you can do a lot. Uh, so even if the woman can share her symptoms, the hot flushes, the sweats, the lack of libido, sometimes vaginal pain, dryness, uh, the lack of mood, lack of motivation, the fatigue, if she can share this with her partner, that itself is therapy. That itself is uh, so much useful for the woman because she thinks that somebody else can understand the changes I'm going through and they can support her. So for example, partners can take this information on board, try and avoid stressful situations for the woman, 
give her more time in her day-to-day -day duties or workload or whatever she wants to do. Try and take off the uh, help her in her day-to-day -day household work or at her workplace if she's having difficulties. You can then help the person make their workplace situation easier. Uh, many partners are very proactive. They try take the woman to the healthcare professional. I sometimes am amazed that the husband or the partner will bring the woman to me saying, she will not talk about it, but I'm going to make the effort that she talks to you because I can see her suffering and I've brought her to you so that we can discuss what might be the things that might help. So you've got both sort of angles. There is some study and not very conclusive, some research observational that suggests if the partner is, is, is able to understand and help cope with symptoms, usually the transition becomes easier. The symptoms become easier for the woman the, the treatments may be less required because there is so much understanding between the partner and the woman. So there's a lot to say that a lot of help mentally, psychologically that can be given by the partners if they're understanding. And, and it takes very little to kind of share the symptoms and, and the helpful strategies, but it's very useful in uh, for those especially who have a difficult menopause. Thank you, Dr. Bikram. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I wanted to um, stick with the men engagement again. In many cultures, men are not really ready to listen about the, um, that kind of stuff. I remember, even we, if we invited them for the talk or the, for the for the training, they send the someone, the woman from their office. They don't like to listen at all. And in that case, how could we engage them? Do you have any idea or any experience? Um, in this regard, please? Well, I have struggled with that too. Uh, you're not alone in that. Is that sometimes I do talks outside UK in some other countries and you find that most of the audience is women. Men usually don't like to join with the topic of menopause. But I think it's changing. Uh, it's for us to keep spreading the word, keep making the awareness more and more that it's not just the woman who is suffering. If the woman is suffering, the whole family suffers, the whole community suffers, the whole country suffers. So really, it is everybody's business. I'm not saying that all women would like to go and talk about their menopause openly. It's not the case. But for those who need support, it is equally important for men in their life or other women in their life to give them that support. So men joining the conversation is really important. And the, the, the way we do it is we keep going out there to health professionals, to men, to community members to say, your involvement is really important in this because you will have women in your life or individuals in your life uh, who will be going through menopausal process and it may be difficult for some. If you cannot help them directly, you can signpost them or offer them some advice where they can go and have that help. And so I think it's just building up those networks and persistently trying to get them involved in the programs and conversation. In the end, it will pay off. Certainly in the UK, there's much more talk about it, much more openness. And I'm sure it will happen everywhere as the word spreads. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was invited to talk, to talk about the menopause in the very successful private uh, bank in Nepal. And since beginning of our conversation, I keep insisting to involve the men as well. And but I, I ultimately I was failed. Only there were hundred women from different uh, positions, but there was no single man. And during discussion, I, I encourage them to um, to engage uh, with their husband. If they are not able to invite their um, uh, uh, supervisors, men supervisors, they can engage at least their husband. And even that case, I could not make it happen. And then likewise, when I was in London, I was invited in a, um, one school. Uh, our our uh, UK chapter coordinator, Sudha Gurung, um, arranged a few uh, talks in English um, uh, college and schools. And in his schools, uh, there were only the girls. And then I was really shocked. And then we inquired later and they said, oh, it's, 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 the boys uh, no need uh, the information about the menstruation. So that was the experience I um, I faced. So I always struggle to engage the men in, in the conversation of the dignified uh, menstruation and dignified menopause. That is why even in 2021... Hopefully that will change. Hopefully yes, that will change in the years. That must be because you are here. 
<laughs> thank you for uh, giving the opportunity for us and i really wanted to jump in uh, like uh, what kind of um role the the children had to play to to create the home is the uh, dignified menopause friendly home even the children ha had to play the certain roles right all of us have a role to play Please. and i think children are important because as children grow up and and the women uh, will go through menopause transition and menopause they will be sometimes the first to notice the difficulties or symptoms that the woman has and we've talked a lot about symptoms say difficult symptom flushes sweats the hormones non hormonal treatment but remember a woman going through menopause is going to lose some of her bone it's the time when bone loss happens so she should be maintaining good bone healthy lifestyle and as a family everyone can make their contribution making sure they have good diet with calcium making sure they have lots of vitamin d through sunlight or other sources making sure they all exercise encourage each other to exercise during this time so that they don't put on weight they maintain their bones looking after cholesterol eating healthy and all the members are important one reinforces the other's behavior so even if it's one member is following healthy lifestyle during this menopausal transition for the woman her heart health her heart lifestyle her bone lifestyle all can be improved because there is someone else in the house who is encouraging motivating and pushing the woman to do well so it's not just the symptoms but the lifestyle changes that are needed during this transition so that the woman can have long term good health for the next 20 30 40 years so children play a very important role in recognizing that the mom may be going through this transition and actually helping her with her lifestyle with her diet with her exercise and symptom resolution besides the partner and the community as a whole it's a joint effort thank you very true and based on your experience uh, while we talk about the children it what is we should engage them for example for the menstruation a global south coalition for dignified menstruation are claiming that for the age of the six we need to engage both uh, boys girls uh, in the conversation because they knew something about menstruation from grocery from movie from the blood spot in bathroom or something like that that is why they need to engage this is how we claim and for the menopause it what is or it what grade we need to engage them and how Again, could we engage the them yes um, and there was a debate about this uh, uh, sort of research about this uh, here as well and it's now been made mandatory that in schools uh the menopause should be taught as part of sex education uh, right from the school age it is important that menopause is talked about or at least heard about at what it is and what women can go through or individuals can go through in their 30s 40s 50s depending on what sort of menopause they have uh, it's the school education right from that point on is very important and also important to be inclusive because it's not just women so we're talking mainly about women here but individuals transgender individuals uh, uh, equally have to be involved in this dialogue uh, across different ethnicities cultures because a lot of uh, talk is about western countries uh, and a little talk about the non western populations uh, or or other ethnicities so inclusiveness besides an early start is really key so that everyone is aware about the issues well in time yes thank you thank you for bringing the agenda of the inclusiveness uh we we call menstruators and non menstruators menstruators means those who are born with the uterus and ovaries so if we use the word of the menstruators uh, the trans um, men queer and uh, uh, menstruators with the disabilities also included and inclusiveness is really really important um let me go again the same uh, how we should engage um uh, children in the conversation around dignified menopause um, you said from the school so in uk or is it mandatory the sexual education is is mandatory in uk one yes. question and the, the other one the does sexual education include the menopause as well because yes, here 
it is part of the school curriculum in the UK. That's right. You mean the menopause and menstruation yes. included in the sex education in a school? Correct. Okay, Correct. excellent. But many organizations are working around the comprehensive sexual education. And if you go through the um, concept guides or, or, the, or the entire sexual um, and reproductive health and rights, the, the menstrual discrimination, menopausal discrimination is really, really missing. And again, in 21st century, we are missing the very important issue. So that is why I wanted to uh, validate to, um, whether I'm uh, understanding well or not. Thank you very much. I think and, as the word spreads around, more and more countries across the world will embrace that, will become menopause, should be part of the school teaching, uh, besides all issues related to menstruation. Uh, and I think more and more countries will take that up. Uh, it is inevitable that they take this up so that the individuals get the help they need early in their life. And what about the um, uh, university degree? I mean, the nursing, doctors, and the public health. Uh, do these curriculums adequately address uh, entire menstrual discrimination, including menopause? Uh, to be honest, the answer is no. So we are fighting, uh, we sort of, uh, when I say we, it's, it's lots of menopause related campaigners across the UK who are really doing a great job to try to get more and more of this on the agenda for universities, for healthcare professional courses, for uh, colleges, as well as for other, say, doctor's courses or MBBS courses, because menopause is talked very little. Similarly, many of the issues related to menstruation are talked very little. It's a lot about clinical medicine, but the, but the related issues such as menopause, menstruation, inclusiveness gets dismissed or not covered adequately as part of normal curriculum in these colleges or universities. So the aim is to try and get that included so that people understand what is equality, what is inclusiveness, what are the real issues related to menstruation or menopause. Uh, and much more needs to be done. So that is the work for us in the next 10 or 20 years. Oh, 20 years, my goodness. Long way to go and forget about the global south. So sad. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the positive things. Uh, we talk about the family, we talk about the, um, the role of the partners, children's, and let's talk about the role of the um, government. Uh, um, I really wanted to know more details in, uh, from UK uh, and you are involving in the European Menopausal Society and if there are any best practices uh, tackling the um, uh, menopausal discrimination, uh, please uh, feel free to share here. There has been a lot done in the past decade. It has been slow to happen, but I can see in the last five or 10 years, the landscape for menopause has changed Lots of campaigners, male, female, uh, or transgender individuals have campaigned for menopause uh, at workplace, at home, in healthcare settings. So you can see that there is an all-party parliamentary group in the parliament now uh, working on menopause, trying to get people's opinions on menopause, trying to set recommendation. When should women be offered checks for menopause or information about menopause? There is a plan that there will be some menopause uh, campaigns in future uh, through government, non-government organizations. Hopefully they will happen soon to try and give a positive note to menopause because it's not always all negative. Menopause is a phase of life. For many women, it will be positive, the best part of their life where they can be most productive. Others may have very difficult symptoms and can seek help, whether it's HRT or non-hormonal or lifestyle changes. And so all that can be brought to public through public health campaign about what are the changes to the bone, to the heart, to the brain that happen during menopause. How can you optimize your lifestyle to live better in the next 20, 30, 40 years? That will be crucial as part of public health campaign. There are also independent campaigners. So lots of clinics, lots of menopause campaigners on their own have started movements and they're producing leaflets. They are trying to uh, social media campaign, uh, they're trying to create these so that more and more people on their phones have access to these content, listen to these, uh, and then also get the patient information leaflets so that they can read what can be the important bits about menopause. 
So from not being talked about, not being offered help or HRT 10, 15 years ago, now we have a situation that is so much on internet, so much on social media and platforms, and many healthcare professionals are getting more and more training so that they're up to date with HRT or other uh, modalities of treatment. The only sort of caution during all this is happening is it's very important that it is evidence-based medicine that you stick to. So this should not be an opportunity to make money for people who do not do it in the right interest. Menopause should not be a, a, a way to make money or menopause should not be exploited as a way to sell products. What is important is really the information should help that grassroots person who is not able to get that help easily or is embarrassed to seek help and get the right evidence-based scientific advice. Not something because you can sell a hormone product or a non-hormone product, but it's really the woman's interest should be at the heart of it. And we are seeing that there's lots of positive happening about menopause right now. Also, many workplaces are coming with policies. It's not mandatory that a workplace has a menopause policy in the UK, it's not legal, but almost all big workplaces are now instituting policies so that women can be helped at work. So if you're having a difficult menopause, you can have flexible working, uh, access to cooling systems or fans at work. Uh, you may be given some uh, alternative work, which is easier if it's a difficult time. Uh, you can have a temperature control in the room. Uh, and of course, help in terms of CBT, psychological help. All that is happening as part of workplace help for women. More and more organizations are starting to do that, which is wonderful. Yeah, it is really wonderful. Very, very lovely to hear it. Oh, my goodness. People are listening about our voice. I, I'm about 50 and I also experiencing the perimenopausal symptom and I really feel so emotional. Thank you very much for sharing. And um, uh, uh, usually people, while we, people who are working around, around empowerment or human rights or gender-based violence, they, they, they don't think uh, the perimenopause or menopause is, is the reason that. Do you have any any suggestions or recommendation or your comment in this uh, regard? Well, I think if it's not on their agenda, they're missing a big piece of the, the, the whole puzzle. You cannot separate menopause from a woman's life. Yes, some will have it very easy, which is what we hope for everyone, which is great. But some may have difficulties. There are plenty of lifestyle issues which need to be addressed for later on a long-term health. And so every public health campaigner who is campaigning for women's health or health in general will always have to take on menopause as one of their part of the program because you can't miss this out. Women spend more than a third of their life in menopause now, and this could be really productive, most important phase of life for them. And we want to minimize ill health, minimize mental as well as physical ill health for them. So this is crucial part of uh, the program if you're, if you're working in the area. Um, impressive. Um, I, I really don't understand while going through the uh, international policies around gender inclusion and um, gender equality and social inclusion, JC policies. And globally, from UN, INGOs, and even the small NGOs, the government keep talking about the JC policy or gender responsive budget or gender responsive um, programs. They keep talking here and there. And I always really feel so sad. I don't see the um, needs and priorities of the menstruators. And um, I really found myself so very excluded, very much alone. And to me, even I see the essence, the connection with the fish, because of the uh, symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, the menstruators, um, uh, their, their individual peace is really breaking inside themselves. And that kind of things is not becoming the issue. Um, here in Nepal, the Nepal chapter um, participating in peace dialogue uh, network. And then my colleagues often receiving the uh, 
a comment from these friends. Oh, I see there, there's a very long distance between peace and the uh, dignified menstruation. So, so that kind of comments we keep receiving and I really feel to, felt sad and bad. Uh, do you have any comments or ideas or recommendation in this regard so um, our colleagues can can understand and we also um, educate about it and then we can um, use these uh, tips uh, in our upcoming days well i think the, my, my comment will be more or less similar to what i said previously is that this particular phase of perimenopause menopause postmenopause can be easy for some but quite challenging for others whether you've had premature menopause, early menopause, natural menopause, medical menopause, or surgical menopause, each one has its own challenges for symptoms, for quality of life, for your health. And so individual's peace or individual's role in the wider society, family, community will be really directly influenced by how good the menopausal transition is for that individual. So you cannot take these issues in isolation. You have to work for betterment of long-term health and menopause becomes a critical part of it for women or individuals. So really, you cannot separate these issues out. You have to talk about them together. That would be my message. Very true, thank you. And let's talk about the media. Um, usually there is no news about the menstruation or menopause at first. And if there is, most of the times, the, even the Guardian, the BBC, CNN, uh, Al Jazeera highlighted about the tax. Um, to, to what extent the tax is reduced, whether the government is distributing the menstrual product free or not, that kind of things we can see it. But um, I don't know, I, I may not know. Um, what, would, what is your experience regarding the menopause in media? And what kind of news is uh, they are covering and what should be covering? We can talk a lot about it. I think the media has a big role in society because people still depend on media to get their information, whether it's social media, television, radio, print, anything, any form of media. Traditionally, the coverage about menopause in media has been very little and it's negative. Uh, media was involved in highlighting the dangers of HRT 20 years ago about link of hormones to breast cancer, blood clotting, stroke, heart disease, which turned out to be an uh, exaggerated scare. But the media has done its work now, at least in the UK, I see lots of positive articles, lots of helpful articles regarding HRT, non-HRT, management of menopause, what difficulties women can have during menopause. They are coming now. But I think media has not done enough, whether it's the menstruation or menopause. Uh, there is plenty more message, helpful messaging, signposting that can be done through their medium for everyone, whether you're a 10 year old, a 20, 30, 40, 50 year old. You can be given lots of messages about signposting, helping. What simple things can you do in your life to make the process of menstruation or menopause easier? Where is the help available? Is it public health? Is it campaigns? Is it online resources you can help you with? Can you read some books which would be recommended? What are the medical options? Who do you see for them? When do you see a doctor? Do you have to only take HRT or there are so many non-HRT things you can do, non-hormonal things? Yourself. Can you then set up community groups which can help other people? All these ideas can be very effectively disseminated by media. I don't see that happening as much. Sensational news are usually picked up quickly, but something that is non-sensational, which many readers may not uh, read, sometimes is not often the highlight of newspapers or the, or the television media. So my, my request to them, plea to them is, please cover these aspects. Please cover the positive aspect of how we can come together to make this physiological process a natural process, easy for women or individuals. And again, in an inclusive way, not leaving anybody behind, not leaving men, women, transgender, individual, nobody should be left behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. By giving the roles of so many uh, people like family, the partner, the workplace, the government, the, uh, everyone, and even that case, the menstruators still hesitate to talk. 
to share about their um, ex experiences, symptoms, because of the travel. In, in, in this, in this uh, scenario, how would we empower them as an individual level? What should they do? I think they should, they should basically not hesitate. I know that message is difficult to get across, but we now live in the 21st century. We are in 2023. We've just seen what a pandemic like COVID can do, how bad it can be for the whole world. We know that life is short. We have to make the most of it. And therefore you now have access to many new channels, which many women say 20, 30 years ago did not have the social media, the channel to talk to people on internet, uh, the access to articles, the access to uh, other forms of television or print media. And of course, you have got evidence-based healthcare practitioners in public health or private sector, if you can afford to see them and try and make the most of it. Do not hesitate because if you hesitate, if you do not seek help and if you're going through a difficult time, it will be you who will be at loss. And so try and come forward. You don't have to share your story with everyone. If you're able to, if you're able to motivate other women individuals, that's great. But for your own sake as an individual, you have got help and support available. Some places more, some places less. But if you make the effort, you will be able to access it sooner or later. On our part, as organizations who work in menopause or as individuals who work for menopause, I think it's a big, big responsibility for us that we keep spreading this information and make this accessible to every woman who wants to listen about menopause, know what is going on in her body and make some changes or, or, or get to places which can help her. That's our responsibility to keep sharing that data or information, which is through programs like this and many others. Yeah, very cool. And um, upcoming... October 14 and 15, the Myanmar um, country office, uh, I mean, the uh, partner organization of the Global South Coalition is uh, will be organizing the two days virtual uh, workshop and Minister of Justice, and we'll be speaking about the menopause as well. Um, so we, we should uh, capitalize each and every moment to talk about the Yes. dignified menopause very true and all menstruators deserve to have the dignified menopause so um, to raise the voice we will be more loud in uh, international uh, menopause day would you little bit share about this theme is your plan and your appeal to the global audience please yes this year the theme is cardiovascular disease uh, it, it is just one theme. It doesn't mean that rest of the menopause is not important. Every year, the International Menopause Society chooses one theme to highlight or focus on one issue that can come up during menopause. This year, of course, it's heart disease because women can have a slight increase in risk of heart disease after menopause. And there are various lifestyle, non-hormonal, hormonal interventions that can help. And so to bring awareness to this, this year, we'll be talking a lot about cardiovascular health after menopause. But it's menopause that is the main thing. It's getting people to talk about it uh, without any shame and getting people to help as many individuals as possible. So there'll be lots of programs across UK, across world. The IMS, the British Menopause Society, will be organizing lots of programs, webinars, as well as I think there'll be lots in print media. So keep your uh, uh, eyes open, ears open, uh, because you will have lots of information you can access on these topics around the time. Yeah, Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation also will organize the programs on that day. Um, uh, friends, please keep watching us and also following us through the social media. And please sub subscribe to our newsletter. We keep sharing the information about um, dignified menopause as well. Um, and uh, Dr. Bikram, uh, we, as I said earlier, Global South Coalition initiated the International Dignified Menstruation Day since 2019. Upcoming uh, 8th of December will be the fifth um, International Dignified Menstruation Day. We have already um, decided the theme for this year. Uh, Dignified menstruation is an integral for ending sexual violence and child marriage because uh, this is the issue 
uh, very common issue um, across the global south and as a, as a leader of the global south i mean the leading the organization from global south we need to address uh, the issues which we are really suffering so even that case we will be organizing the programs around dignified menopause as well this year we have a plan to organize the uh, virtual symposium um, on that day and definitely we will uh, include uh, the dignified uh, uh, menopause because for us Dignified menstruation is a life cycle of what's not the five days of the bleeding. And the menstruation is one coin, other one one side of the coin, and the menopause is the other side of the coin. So we cannot forget uh, uh, each menstruators deserve the dignity uh, throughout their okay. life cycle from all okay. identities, no matter whether they are in a ICU because of the pandemic or the uh, earthquake or tsunami or ebola everywhere or in the war um, we are very close to our time um do you have uh, any um the uh, masses uh, to share with the audience uh, um, during the day of the dignified mission day december 8 or in general uh, please uh, um, share uh, is, is, is a last um, remark Oh, that's fine. Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's been wonderful talking. My only message would be menopause can affect potentially half the world's population. And it's unique to each individual. So some may have it easy, some may have a difficult transition. There are lots of lifestyle and long-term health issues around menopause, which we understand better now. It should be a topic which should be open to talk about. There shouldn't be any taboo or stigma. So if you are in a position to help somebody going through menopause, whether as a partner, as a child, as a community member, as a work colleague, and in any other position, then do make that effort because you can do a lot to make that person's life or journey through menopause much better. So do everything you can without any taboo or shame because it it's a physiological process and you can do loads for individuals to make life easy for them. That would be my final message. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, no matter where we are, no matter what kind of profession we have been doing, we all are for the dignified menopause uh, uh, because we are here for, 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 um, for serving. We are here for the humanity. And that is why no matter where we are, we, we keep doing whatever possible from our side. And friends uh, who are watching now and will be watching later through the Facebook live, Facebook video or the YouTube channel, please keep following us. Uh, we will um, be doing the webinars uh, as, as always. And thank you very much, Dr. Bikram. It's a great honor. I really personally, I, I, I really um, humbled and this is just beginning. Uh, we need to keep Definitely. continue the talk and I will be connecting with other friends in other countries where our partner organization, the steering country members are working and we'll be uh, together in this journey and we'll make the difference. Thank and we are much. here for the dignified menstruation and menopause. Thank you very much.